Ah, hello. Um, yeah, it's the landscape near, near where I live here. Um, so I'm really sorry not to be able to be present uh, physically in Trieste. Uh, I wanted to join you and then uh, one of my flights was canceled and it was too complicated to organize another travel. Um, but anyway, I enjoy uh, the talks and I, I will I will now um, switch to my, I share my screen. Uh, I have a problem with sharing my screen. That's okay. You know, these, these new computers are too, uh, too safe now and uh, it becomes really complicated. Okay. Ah. Okay, we see your slides. Can, can you see my slides now? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, great, now, great, great. However, it's in presenter mode, so we see both uh, the slide uh, and the next uh, slide. That's not what I have on my screen. Uh, wait, wait, wait. So, uh, this is really. Uh, yeah, maybe, sorry, I'm going to change my, um, my video. Yeah, you, you can try to stop to, the, the, not, not stop the sharing screen, but uh, like remove the presenter mode. Yeah, now try to do, yeah, he's using Zoom. Okay. Oh yeah, now it's good, now it's okay. okay. And now it's okay? Okay, good. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so I, my presentation is about, is about the long-term dynamics and sustainability of human nature interactions. So it's a new research project that I've developed during the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, you must know that I'm an ecologist, a theoretical ecologist. So I mostly studied so far um, changes in biodiversity uh, it, it's the left graph, um, changes in biodiversity, how they affect e ecosystem functioning and in term ecosystem functioning, possibly even human well-being. But actually, um, when we made a synthesis of that uh, research area, what we showed in that particular paper that I'm showing this uh, uh, figure now, uh, is that th there was a... Um, there's a loop actually that needs to be closed between what humans are doing, which is in, uh, in yellow at the bottom, and then uh, the, the ecological dynamics, biodiversity ecosystems that are in blue, and then in between we have the anthropogenic drivers and ecosystem services. There's also a scale issue, but I'm not going to address it um, in my presentation here. So I became interested, uh, or before that paper already, in uh, trying to close this loop. And so how can you do that? Well, there are different ways of, of doing that. The way I personally addressed it is, is that is by um, you know, trying to extend an approach that was developed by two economists, Brander and Taylor, uh, some time ago, who were interested in why um, the Easter Island civilization collapsed. And so they developed a simple economic model of the of Easter Island. And so the interesting of that uh, uh, approach is that it's, it's very simple. So basically what they, what they did is to build a simple ecological economic model in which you have basically two variables. One is just a natural stock, which 
was just assumed to, to have logistic roles for simplicity. Then you have a whole machinery in terms of economics, but which is uh, vastly simplified by assuming that you have a kind of uh, economic equilibrium and maximization of utility, uh, etc. So, so that uh, reduces the system quite a bit. And then you have labor, which is essentially the human population, which grows when harvest uh, grow. And they ended up with a very simple system, which actually turns out to be a lot of ultra predator prey uh, model, where labor, that is the human population, is the predator, and uh, the harvested natural stock is the resource. OK, and so they, they spent a lot of time. Uh, and they were really excited about these results, and they, they show nice uh, pictures of uh, face planes and, uh, and uh, time trajectories for uh, these kinds of systems, which incidentally are very well known in, in ecology already. And they claim that actually, since you have a kind of uh, dark oscillation, then this could possibly explain the collapse of the Easter civilization. Well, I don't want to debate about that conclusion, but anyway, I, I felt that the general approach was uh, quite interesting. And so we decided to build uh, other kinds of models with the same philosophy. And so since my interest was on uh, biodiversity changes, and as you know, uh, at least in terrestrial systems, uh, the biggest threat to biodiversity is land use change. So we started building models of a human population converting lands. So you have uh, lands that can be in two states, uh, either natural or, or converted, and then uh, mostly used for agriculture. And then, which of course has an impact, uh, a generally a negative impact on biodiversity. But then we also built in our uh, model a whole layer of economics behind it, which makes it very complicated at first sight. But using the, the kind of tricks that Brander and Taylor developed, we were able to remove them. They are, in a way, built in the parameters of the model. And so the model actually reduces to three variables this time, the human population, Technology, because it, it turns out to play a big role, and then uh, biodiversity dynamics. And our main interest with that first model was to look at extinction depth. And um, I don't know if you know that concept of extinction depth. It's basically the fact that when you destroy land, uh, natural land currently, um, you are actually committing uh, species to extinctions in the future. That is, species don't disappear immediately as you convert land. Uh, by the way, this is the common mistakes that people do in, uh, you know, um, uh, on, on the radio, etc. or even scientists, when they talk about extinctions, they provide um, uh, estimates of rates of, of, of extinctions that are much higher than in reality. Actually, we commit species to extinction but they are not yet extinct. And so that's the extinction debt. And so the idea is that if you have delayed biodiversity dynamics, which we know uh, happens, we have a lot of uh, evidence for that, then you basically get the, uh, the, the first three graphs there, uh, show panels show uh, what would happen for the amount of natural land, that's a gray uh, line, and then to, for the human population, that's the solid line. And you in, uh, in the, the three panels ABC uh, have increasing extinction depth. And you see that at first, when you don't have extinction depth, then that particular model leads to a stable equilibrium. Then if you increase a bit extinction depth, you start seeing oscillations. And eventually, if you have too uh, large an extinction depth, then you start having a collapse of the human population. So basically, this very simple model already shows that uh, uh, delayed biodiversity dynamics can generate environment, environmental crisis to the point of it even leading to the collapse of uh, the human population. We also use the same model to show that uh, it can also make other predictions. Uh, for instance, if you 
protect, start protecting land. If, well, the fraction has to be, of land protected has to be large enough, but then you can stabilize the system. That's uh, with the same parameter values. That's the right panel. So clearly protection of a large enough fraction of land can ensure sustainability. So that's a good uh, thing because we, that's predicted by a lot of other approaches. We also check that actually um, an approach based on a, uh, a tax uh, taxation of, um, of uh, con land conversion can work too. So we build a, a more elaborate economic model showing that um, a land tax policy that maximizes the discounted sum of um, uh, benefits um, in the long run can also ensure sustainability. And moreover, if you uh, see, for instance, uh, well, the graphs when you compare the green and um, black lines, you see that actually um, this kind of policy is beneficial for both biodiversity and, and the human population. So there's no trade-off here. It's beneficial to both. Okay, so something that is obviously missing in these first models is the fact that the human population is not homogeneous and also there are delays in the behavior, in behavioral changes in the human population. So our next step was actually to use the same kind of model, but um, dividing the human population into two groups. It's of course a, of course a big uh, simplification, but we define two groups, uh, defectors and conformers. So it means that defectors are, well, it's a classical uh, evolutionary game. Huh? Uh, so it's inspired by that. So basically conformers conform to a, a rule that benefits uh, collective well-being and defectors play their own uh, according to their own interest and so don't uh, obey the rule. What we could show then is um, that um, the outcome depends a lot on what we call here the sanction level, but it's not truly a sanction. It's really the relative benefit that the conformers gain by playing the game uh, relative to the defectors. So it can be a positive thing and not just a negative um, uh, intervention. So what you see here is the human population as a function of the proportion of conformers uh, from which can vary from zero to one. And um, so everything depends on the sanction level. When the sanction level is too weak, what happens is that whatever the initial proportion of conformers, the system moves to the red equilibrium, which is the unsustainable equilibrium. When you start having a, a, a larger level of sanction, uh, in between you have a, a the middle graph shows that uh, you have two alternative equilibria, one which is ma made up of only conformers and the other one with a mixture of the two strategies and only with a very st uh, strong level of sanction or relative benefit of conformers, can you get um, fixation of the conformer strategy, uh, but it also depends on the initial proportion of the two strategies because you have alternative stable states. So basically, um, um, this shows that, um, sorry. Um, the, this shows that um, wh when you have um, several strategies in the population, it's much more difficult to reach uh, sustainability, which makes a lot of sense. Um, this is compounded by the effect of the extinction debt, of course, because these are the, if, you know, the endpoints of the um, uh, time trajectories, but actually if you have a large enough extinction debt, then, then you get a lot of uh, transient dynamics that can be uh, very complicated with a lot of ups and downs. Right, so um, to move a bit further, um, we um, 
um, try to build a model uh, where um, we, we no longer uh, have, uh, sorry, yeah. So we no longer have economics because uh, you know the model the, the, the model is a bit constrained by the economic um, assumptions, but where we could have a bit more details about the uh, ecological um, uh, processes going on. And so we, with one of my postdocs, Kirsten Henderson, we started building some uh, more detailed models. Um, they are just more detailed in the fact that they have three kind of land uses, A, agriculture, N is, um, is natural, and then D is degraded. Uh, degraded can uh, include urban as well. So it's neither agriculture or natural. And this can include a lot of other processes like restoration, natural regeneration, natural degradation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when when we oops, sorry. So when we um, parameterized our model uh, with the data on the global uh, trends in land use and populations, human population size. So we basically uh, parameterized the model uh, between with data from the period 1960 to 2014. And the right graph uh, panel shows what the model predicts for the trends in uh, the human population and then natural land, agricultural land and degraded land. And as you see from the blue curve, I mean, the predictions match relatively well the demographic predictions for the human population. So it's not completely unrealistic. It's, uh, we don't claim that our model is the best representation of what will happen, but it's ex at least something that we can play with, uh, with a, a certain uh, uh, confidence. So basically we use that model to actually uh, play uh, uh, with the various kinds of measures that we could um, implement. Uh, so we, we define two types of measures. Uh, one is proactive and the other reactive. A proactive measure is uh, a measure that where you have an intervention before changes happen. So that could be, for instance, avoiding or increasing land degradation. That's the one that we use here. And then a reactive measure can be, okay, given that the natural land de degrades, then you can restore uh, the land towards the natural state. So that's what we call reactive. And when you vary these two measures, actually the, uh, the four panels show that you can change a lot because the, all the green and, and gray areas are, you know, the what we can change by changing our behaviors. And you see that it's possible to change human population size and the amount of natural land that is left in the future to a very large extent. But when you look at the last graph, uh, the bottom right graph, that's where you have a, a negative proactive uh, measure that is fixed. And then you, you look at when you vary your reactive measures. So you restore a lot, of, a lot of natural land, for instance. But you can, as you can see from that panel, it's really hard to revert a trend that um, was negative in the first place. So basically the conclusion that we draw from this exercise is that changes in human behavior obviously can make a difference, but reactive measures are not enough to ensure sustainability. And so this is a really sobering message because it means that what people are doing today uh, will make a big difference for the future. And even in the future, we might not be able to revert, um, reverse the processes going on now. Well, we know the same with climate change, huh? that it will be very difficult to go back in time uh, once it's, it is starting. It's even worse than that because with the same approach, then we build a more complex model where we uh, divided the world into several regions where here only two regions. 
And um, so it's a model that includes uh, human migration um, and an equal access to resources. For instance, we divided the world into, in this particular case, into two regions. One is a low income region. You can view this as a kind of a developing world. And then uh, a high income region, which you can see, you could see as a, the developed world. And of course, in time, uh, you know, the situation in, in the two regions change and people start moving based on opportunities for, you know, uh, for instance, agricultural production, uh, presence of natural land, etc. So the model is a bit more complicated, um, but the assumptions are relative, uh, relatively simple. So when people can gain more uh, by moving, eventually they start moving. And as you can see, this simple fact uh, changes the dynamics completely. At the bottom, you have the same model with the same parameters, but you take just an average. So you have a single region where everyone behaves in the same way. And you see that based on current trends, so this is based on the trends from the previous model with a single region, you can see that uh, you move from 2070 to 2750 um, to a world where um, you have a lot of uh, urban or degraded land, very little natural land, but overall, I mean, the number of people is reduced and well-being, which, which is indicated by a color, is quite high. So you have a few happy people in a way, despite the fact that natural land is destroyed. But with the same parameters, if you have two interacting regions, look at what happens uh, in 2750. Uh, in the low income region, basically you have uh, uh, overexploitation of, oops, sorry, overexploitation of the land with a moderate amount of people but the black color indicates that well-being is extremely low, so it's basically famine. In the high income region, you basically have the same situation uh, with a bit more people, a bit less famine, but still it's red, so it means well-being very low. So this is a simple exercise to show that an equal access to resources coupled with human migration can make a, a huge difference and it can be a big factor undermining uh, global sustainability. Right, so um, in the second part of my talk, I, I, I would like to show you a few results from our more recent work, which is um, intended to represent something at a small scale, let's say a regional scale, something like that. Um, where we focus on agricultural land use because, um, well, the use of, of land for agriculture is one of the big problems that has been de debated a lot in the literature. For instance, there has been a lot of debate about uh, two strategies uh, to exploit uh, the land, land, land sharing and land, land sparing. So in land sharing, the idea is that you exploit a lot of the land, but with a low intensity. And land sparing, you exploit the land on small surfaces, but very intensely to try to save as much of the rest of the land for, for natural land. So we build a similar kind of model as the previous one with um, three states for, for the land, natural, agricultural, degraded, then this produces resources which feed the human population and in turn um, the humans decide to convert or not or to intensify or not. And so there's a parameter beta um, that determines whether you, you, you do land sharing or land sparing. Basically when beta is small on the left you have low intensity and when it's high on the right, then you, you have a high intensity on smaller uh, areas. So th that model, um, which is built a bit with 
somewhat uh, different assumptions um, actually shows the the graph shows the, the, the time trajectories of the system. You, you see that both extremes, land sharing and land sparing, can lead to a stable equilibrium. But in between, you get a, a co complete collapse of the system with, in red, the degraded land that uh, uh, dominates the whole system. So we looked a bit in more details uh, about what is driving this, but uh, I'm not going to look into the details here. What we can see is that um, the four panels here show um, what happens with a, a varying amount of uh, rates of recovery from the degraded states. So there's a natural regeneration of degraded land. And what you see basically um, is that at the bottom, when the natural rate of regeneration is very fast, then you avoid the collapse in between. But when it becomes uh, lower, then as you move up, you see that there's a, a whole range of possibilities where you have a collapse of the system. So uh, I must make sure that you understand that there's a kind of trade-off in, in this particular scenario between agricultural intensity and land conversion. Uh, and that's what creates this, this, um, these uh, different outcomes. So basically, actually in, in this particular model, uh, in this particular um, uh, results, what we assume is a linear trade-off between the land conversion rate and agricultural intensity. In fact, if you look at the where there's a collapse uh, in between, you see that there's a whole region um, that is shown in orange where uh, the collapse is inevitable. And then there are, there's a whole blue region where there's a viable equilibrium. And so it really depends on how you build your trade-off and where it falls, et cetera. And so our main conclusion here is that naive land use planning can easily drive the social ecological system to an irreversible collapse. Uh, again, it really depends on how the two kinds of behaviors trade off with each other. And without knowing that in detail, then you can easily go to collapse in the long run. We went a bit, a bit further than that using a, a, a spatially explicit model. Also, it's a kind of a grid model where, um, again, you have the same principle uh, with uh, natural land, uh, agricultural land, two types of agricultural lands, actually, where they are low intensity or high intensity, and then degraded land, then you have the human population. But this time, there's a spatial structure in the system such that, um, well, you can, the humans can decide to aggregate agriculture, uh, to cluster it. Um, and also, um, there's a spatially explicit provision of ecosystem services coming from surrounding natural areas. So when you have large natural areas in, in your vicinity, <coughs> in the vicinity of a crop, then you get a lot of services. That's basically the, the, general, uh, the general ID. The interesting thing is that by looking at the spatial dynamics of this system, then you get what is called a percolation transition, which is known in, in, in by physicists huh, usually. So what happens is that and you see that, for instance, in the upper left graph, as you uh, decrease the fraction of natural land, so, so there's a population that starts uh, using natural land, converts it. And once you cross a threshold, which is shown by the, the vertical gray line, then you start losing your large uh, fragments. This is, this is shown in the upper left graph, very suddenly. So that, that's what is called, called uh, percolation. Suddenly you lose your large fragments. And you can see that at the bottom uh, left, uh, you see that uh, suddenly the number of fragments increase while at the same time the fragments become smaller. 
The problem is that that's what you can see uh, in the middle graph on the top. The mean ecosystem service provision depends a lot on the, on the largest fragment size. And so the end result is that the um, resource production per unit time, which is so shown um, in the, on the upper right panel, uh, start to decrease, to drop sharply once you cross the per, uh, per collision threshold. And what humans do in, in this situation, well, because they have to feed the human population, and what, what they do is actually what, what is shown in the um, lower right graph, the, uh, they increase their propensity to expand agriculture. Just after the percolation threshold, you see that suddenly, boom, the intensity of the, uh, the propensity to expand agriculture increases a lot. So that shows that actually, Spatial dynamics is quite in, important and agricultural expansion can cause a percolation transition that leads to abrupt habitat fragmentation that leads humans to further aggravate landscape degradation. So that's why you become easily trapped into a kind of collapse situation. And the model shows that actually neither land sharing nor land sparing as they are traditionally defined are the best strategies. Um, actually, the, well, yeah, the, the most favorable strategies are the white ones as, as it, it's a darker red. Actually, um, you need a lot of natural land to avoid irreversible collapse. When it's white, it means that you are less threatened because uh, if you lose more natural land, you can still be safe. And you see that the best strategy is in the lower right corner. So the best strategy is clearly to prevent severe, uh, uh, to prevent uh, severe habitat fragmentation and foster sustainability is a combination of high agricultural clustering, which is on the right, and low intensification, uh, which is uh, along the vertical axis. So it provides some new perspectives on this uh, land sharing, land sparing debate. Okay, if I have a, you know, I still have a bit of time. So I wanted to show you um, a kind of um, uh, still the same kind of work on agricultural landscapes, but it's less about the feedback between humans and, um, and, um, and biodiversity or land conversion. It, it's here a, a more, it's a, at a even lower scale at trying to reconcile biodiversity conservation and food production in these landscapes. So we are really at the landscape level this time. And our idea with this particular approach was to look at pollination as the main service provided by natural uh, fragments. So basically you have a system which is quite classical where you have crops that depend or not, uh, the, the amount of dependence can change uh, on pollination uh, for its production. So the first, the first graph uh, panel A shows that as you increase the number of natural, uh, semi-natural habitat, then you increase biodiversity. So that's normal. That's what we expect from what we know uh, on ecology. Then if you look at pollination, uh, uh, pollination is actually the amount of crop that is pollinated. Um, so, so it's a kind of service that uh, humans receive from pollination. And so you see that actually it has a hump shape with a, a bell-shaped curve with the amount of semi-natural semi habitat, uh, which makes sense because when you have no semi-natural habitat, you have no pollination. And when you have a lot, then there's a lot of pollinators, but actually there's not a lot of crops. And so obviously your production goes down. So that's basically what the, the basic model shows, which makes a lot of sense. And then of course, you can also have uh, an 
independent crop yield, which doesn't depend on pollination. And that one, of course, will gradually decrease with the amount of semi-natural habitat. So everything depends in the system on how much of your crops uh, are pollinated and how much are um, not pollinated. And so we build a, 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 a spatially explicit model, again, to look at the effect of fragmentation. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we were able to derive a, a kind of measure, which we call landscape pollination potential, that actually captures all the spatial aspect of, of the system. And what we could show here is we, we basically get the same patterns as before. So the, the, the main trends are identical. Simply, um, when you have more efficient pollinators or lower level of fragmentations, because both increase uh, the, this uh, aggregated measure uh, for um, the amount of uh, the, the maximum amount of pollination possible over the landscape. Basically, you move up along the curves that are shown here. And so basically, you increase the magnitude, which is the, the panel A, or the stability also of uh, um, animal dependent crop poly, poly, uh, production, so based on pollination, and also your crop yield per area. So, so that's what we can uh, uh, show with that kind of model. The interesting thing then, then, then is that is to show the biodiversity effects more explicitly in this kind of model. And um, so we had a, in these graphs, we have a, exactly the same kind of shape of curves for animal dependent crop production, then the stability of this production yield per area. And you see that biodiversity effects are turned off or on. And you clearly see that when you add effects of biodiversity on um, uh, pollinator carrying capacity and a kind of insurance effect on, on, its, uh, on pollination, then you uh, have a clear benefit from biodiversity in this kind of system. So the, the effect of biodiversity increases the magnitude and stability of all these uh, variables. Okay, yeah, maybe I'll skip this because I want to save a bit of time for. Okay, before before uh, going to the last two slides, um, a few conclusions that emerged from all this work, I think relatively clearly is that Linking biodiversity ecosystems and people is critical to understand and predict the long-term dynamics of the global or regional social ecological system. Feedbacks between humans and biodiversity play a key role in sustainability. So I think this is generally underestimated when we talk about global change, we mostly talk about climate change, but I think that the dynamics of biodiversity in the long run is, uh, is key. Collapse of the global social ecological system is likely in the absence of proactive measures that avoid biodiversity loss. Um, so it's not a, what I mean by that is that uh, it's a, it's a common it's a common outcome whatever the kind of model that we build uh, so it doesn't depend on on, on the fine tuned uh, details of of the model. Delayed responses and. It, Unequal access to resources are two major factors that undermine sustainability. So we have to take that into account. Uh, we've just seen that naive land use planning can easily drive these systems to collapse also. I didn't show that, but reconciliation of biodiversity conservation and food production is possible, but requires a big shift in agricultural management. So all that is yeah, some will say pretty pessimistic because it shows that, you know, all these kind of uh, difficulties and collapse are, are quite likely. Um, but I think it's unfortunately 
quite realistic. That's the situation we are facing currently. And so um, uh, my last two slides are about what we can do about, about this. So actually we are convinced that uh, changing our worldview is necessary if, if we want to avoid these um, uh, long-term problems. And if we really want to build sustainability, then we have to change our worldview. And basically we compare here, it's a very simplistic uh, picture, of course. Uh, basically on the left, you have the current situation when we have a disconnection between humans and nature that leads to unsustainable norms and values, behaviors and policies, which leads to extinction of experience. So we, do, we no longer are in touch with nature, so it continues even further. And so it's a kind of vicious circle. And we should shift to, towards a more sustainable vision where we have contact with nature, we have sustainable norms and values, behaviors and policies, and that can lead to a virtuous cycle. And so in this particular study, what we wanted to see is whether simply you, uh, changing human nature connectedness, can it make a difference? And actually it does. Um, so it's a recent paper that was led by a psychologist where we, we made a meta-analysis of many uh, studies, uh, more than 200 studies, either experimental or correlational. And we, we these studies have looked at uh, um, how human nature connectedness is increased or decreased and what is its possible impact. And as you see on the top, the, the experimental studies show that exposure to nature, that's on the left, and mind, mindfulness um, practices improve human nature connectedness. So mindfulness is, uh, for instance, on the right uh, panel. And you see that clearly it increases the um, human nature connectedness. In these experimental studies, these were controlled experiments, so we know the causality. So we know that um, these two kinds of uh, uh, manipulations increase human nature connectedness, and there's some quantitative way to measure it. In the, at the bottom of the graph are correlational studies, and you see here causality is unknown, of course, but you see pretty much the same kind of uh, patterns. So these correlation studies confirm the experimental results. If you, if you change uh, your contact with real nature and mindfulness, that's on the bottom left, you see that you have a clearly positive outcome on human nature connectedness or the reverse, uh, we don't know causality. Um, but also human nature connectedness is positively linked to nature conservation and human welfare. So they are not in opposition to each other, but it's negatively correlated to non-environmental values. That's what is seen in uh, brown at uh, the bottom. You see that the effects are systematically negative, which means that uh, as you decrease human nature connectedness and you, um, you basically have a, um, a less favorable behavior towards the environment. And that's it, I will stop here, uh, except mentioning my main collaborators on these projects, Anne-Sophie Lasfuit, uh, Kirsten Henderson, Diego Bengoshio Paz, Daniel Montoya, and the last, uh, um, work uh, is by Gladys Baragon-Jazon, who uh, comes from experimental psychology. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Now I have to so, stop. Uh, questions? Or, uh, so, so what is the, so what I understand that you have presented are um, essentially theoretical models. And uh, one question is, uh, is there a empirical support for this? Uh, I mean, wh wh how do we stand in terms of validating these models or this insight from models uh, in 
uh, real data? <laughs> That's the traditional question about uh, modeling exercises. I'm not sure that you want to reproduce the Earth system and uh, manipulate uh, <laughs> the system in the, uh, to have an experimental setup, but um, that's not really possible. But uh, simply, we can maybe have uh, some uh, small scale um, data that we could possibly uh, fit to. But currently, we the only thing that we can do is based on the current trends. We know the trends. We know the reasons. And we, our models are basically there to show what is the potential futures. It doesn't tell that it will happen and hopefully it won't happen. <laughs> That's our hope. But we need to know what is the potential futures and what we can do about it. But it's, it's very difficult to, um, to have a full validation of any of these models unless you, you perform some experiments on relatively small scale. So some of these things can be done on small scales. For instance, some of my friends in France are manipulating, uh, uh, are doing experiments with uh, some farmers um, and trying to change their behaviors and they accept to play the game. And so they see the outcome after many years. And so this is something that can be done, but it will never solve the problem of validation at the, the planetary scale, which is uh, impossible. I mean, the, the only way to validate it is to see what will happen in the future. Um, but that's not a good, uh, uh, very good um, um, way to do it because it might be very negative. Yes, thanks. We have another question. Yeah, <clears throat> very interesting. Uh, it's not my field, so I might ask a very naive, stupid question, but here we go. Um, the, at the start, you showed this, um, let's say, few happy people scenario that I found very confusing and counterintuitive uh, because you, you start, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes. You start showing that you got, let's say, seven little people in a box. Uh, they live in a world which is mixed between concrete, forests, uh, a bit of everything. And then you go towards the end of the seventh century, I think, on the scale. And all of a sudden, you end up with one, let's say, one little, one, one little man out of seven. And then it's all still full of concrete and he's still happy for some reason. Uh, I found this very counterintuitive because if you, is there a feedback between how you change the human population and how you maintain the amount of land use or concrete. Uh, it's basically the Chernobyl example. If you remove humans from Chernobyl, it takes 30, 40 years for the city to become a forest. It's back to forested area, more or less. So I don't know. If you, if you, if you can comment on that, this few, uh, few happy people scenario sounds very counterintuitive to me. Because if you wipe out, let's say, one-seventh of the population, there would not be enough humans to maintain the amount of concrete in the cities. and things will collapse and you'll be more, there'll be more wildlife taking, taking place. So something, something I found, sorry, counterintuitive. I might be wrong, I might have missed something. Okay, yeah, that, that's a good question. It, it all depends on the long-term dynamics of, of the system. And remember that this is transient dynamics. Even in, in 2750, it's still transient dynamics because if you let the system continue for millennia, then you will see another pattern and you will probably see what you expect. But the problem is that, uh, well, the model includes a lot of different things, in particular, the effect of technology. And so you can still imagine uh, a, a society where you have a lot of technology, a uh, uh, few um, little la natural land left and still pe people who are relatively uh, well off. I mean, they don't suffer from famine and things like that. So that's a counterintuitive outcome, but it's, it's quite possible within the framework of the model. And of course, in the long run, it will revert to something that, it, that has more nature, probably, but not at, on, on, on that time scale. Thanks. So we have Joel. Uh, Joel, uh, you want to ask a question? Yes. May, may I ask a question, please? Yes, go ahead. In an, early, in an early slide, you showed an equation for the growth of technology. And if I saw it correctly as it went by, in that differential equation, there was a self-limiting factor 
like the logistic factor for population growth. I believe there was a, a maximum and as technology increased, the rate of increase of technology decreased. Yes. I don't know if I saw that. Okay, I did see that right. No, okay. no, no, you're, you're, you are absolutely right. I didn't have the time. So please let me finish my question. Oh, sorry. I have, two, I have two questions. One is, what happens if you remove that constraint and whether that constraint is justified in the historical record? And second, does it make sense to talk about technology as a single quantity when some technologies have adverse environmental impacts and other technologies have very favorable environmental impact. For example, the use of information to guide agricultural activities, to plow in the right places, to, it's a, you know, all, all the benefits that come from informational technology. So one is, does, what happens if there's not that limitation? And two, what happens if you differentiate technology according to its impacts? Thank you. Okay, so yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it's a complicated story. So in that particular uh, model, which was our first model, uh, we indeed implemented a kind of logistic growth for technology with the idea that, um, um, well, through time, technology um, don't necessarily uh, increase uh, until, uh, it, it's not infinite, uh, let's say, the growth, and so it will stabilize somewhere. But Why? That, that's a debatable assumption, of course. You can also have other scenarios where it uh, never stops. And uh, so in, in other um, publications, we have removed that, um, that assumption. And it turns out that actually um, the, the dynamics of technology plays a, a really big role. And uh, regarding your second uh, question, that also plays a big role. What kind of technology, where it goes, for what, etc. So we've played with that on, in another paper that I didn't present in my presentation. And it, it can change a lot of things. So it, the, the model predictions are very sensitive to two things, actually. Um, the first one is how technology is included and what are its impacts. And the other thing that is not in this particular model, it's not explicit at least, is the, the highly nonlinear um, um, relationship between human fertility and, and uh, technology and resource access. And so we've explored that a bit more in uh, other papers and that can lead to very different outcomes. The problem is that many of these outcomes are not necessarily positive, contrary to what you, you could believe. So it, you, it can go all over, all, all over the place, basically. So our basic predictions are valid for the specific assumptions, but it's possible to have other futures as well. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, do you want to do yeah. um, uh, Michelle, I have a very simple question for you. Uh, you mentioned that some naive land planning could lead to collapse. Could you elaborate what you mean by naive or give examples? Well, the example in this particular model, well, you, you, the model about agricultural land use was actually inspired by some uh, real data um, from especially from the South America, where some people have um, uh, formulated the hypothesis that actually we could go, we could uh, be near a, a percolation transition uh, in uh, South America uh, because of land degradation. And so that's actually, you know, that, that's where our work started. And so, the naive uh, land, land planning uh, issue arises from the fact that um, there's no simple relationship between intensification or you know, the sparing versus uh, sharing uh, perspectives. And so if you are stuck in between in such a way that you don't have the right trade-off, then you suddenly go to collapse. And that's what we meant. 
It doesn't mean that necessarily we will go there, but simply if we ignore the compl this complexity and the shape of this trade off, well, we, we just don't know. That, that, that's the, the main idea. It's not that necessarily it will necessarily go there. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, we, there are no more questions, so we thank you again. And, uh, and then we reconvene at uh, a quarter past uh, four. Thank you.